Good afternoon and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 124, Breaking the Rules of Machine Embroidery. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. Happy to have you guys in on this Education Friday to discuss this topic. I think this is going to be something kind of fun and lighthearted because Honestly, as much as I do really think we have issues with uh, kind of deciding on what the rules are of machine embroidery, and you can see that I've got scare quotes all over that, I think what I need to help people understand sometimes is that uh, education and standards and rules are just part of what we do. And so we're going to talk about different kinds of things that we consider rules for machine embroidery. We're going to talk about different ways in which these rules affect us and how we can discuss the process of going beyond them to some degree and when we break them, when we break them to a purpose. Uh, because wherever, wherever we're talking about within the decorating community, uh, this can be outside of embroidery, but specific to embroidery. We're talking about digitizing, we're talking about design, we're talking about execution in the embroidery on the embroidery machine with our materials, or we're talking about business. All of these things are going to come up today. Uh, there are things that we sometimes hear said as rules. We hear them kind of presented as rules as part of what we must do or need to do. And in fact, they may not be the kind of rules that we think they are. So like I said, super lighthearted today. I would love to hear more of these things from you. What do you think are rules that you've broken? Things that you were taught as rules, maybe in your embroidery, whether you are a hobbyist, a decorator, a designer, a digitizer, embroiderer, a heck, if you are a printer, you're here just talking about decoration. What are the rules in business, in your work, in your creativity that you have heard and have broken? I would love to hear more about that while you guys are here. So if you have anything to kick in in the comments, if you're watching live, absolutely love to hear that. Hey, if you're in the hashtag replay squad and you are here after the fact watching the show, I would also love to hear from you about the rules that you feel are worth breaking and why you broke them in the comments so we can all kind of enjoy that perspective. But I'm going to say this, before I start any of the rest of the discussion, uh, you're looking at somebody who's broken the rules many times. And in fact, despite the fact that I'm somebody who teaches them, uh, in the description for the show, I said, you know, you heard your favorite educators and old stitch jockeys like me tell you some rules about how things have to be done for digitizing, for embroidery, for execution, for business. And the truth of the matter is a lot of these things have some gray area, right? There's a lot of stuff that we can talk about as far as where they apply and where they don't. So we're going to, like I said, going to have a fun show, going to just take this lighthearted and I'm talk to you about uh, some of the things that happen in being an educator, because what sometimes happens to me, and I'll just, I'll just lay this out there ahead of time. I will have somebody who's watched many educators, who's been to lots of classes, who's talked to lots of folks in the business, has had mentors from all over, and they'll stop and either they'll do this to me or they'll use my rules and do this to somebody else in the industry. And they'll do a gotcha. They'll be like, Ha, I heard that it has to be this many millimeters before you use this kind of stitch. Ha, it's supposed to be this kind of underlay under foam and not that kind of underlay. I heard this on good authority. That's the right way to do it from X person. And the truth of the matter is there's no gotcha. In the ultimate sense of things, all we have are results to rely upon. Uh, I had somebody who actually uh, mailed me very recently asking about education, and she was kind of a little nonplussed at the fact that we don't have some kind of a certification or a college course for digitizing. Believe me, anybody wants to get a design uh, course together and have a commercial digitizer teach that, they can call me at any time and we'll see what we can work out. But they don't have the ability to get like an official certification to become a professional digitizer. And the truth of the matter is professional digitizers are made by their results. And I will talk about what you can judge as we get through this. Uh, we can judge some things. The hard part, the subjective part, creative interpretation, that's very subjective. We can use different kinds of stitches to show different kinds of shapes. We can make marks in different ways. It's not always going to be the same. It's not always going to be uh, the same kind of stitch for everything. And honestly, the way people choose to use color and shape and to show the different kinds of textures is very subjective. What we can judge to some degree, and, and if you guys have seen me in the episode where I talked about judging digitizing contests, here are the things we actually can kind of judge. And maybe if you want to say, here's the mark of a professional digitizer, yes, is the interpretation attractive and look uh, close enough to the logo uh, that it's a good uh, copy of the logo, that it makes sense to the logo that we're looking for, that it is something that's recognizable? Yes, that's, that's something artistic we can judge. But the stuff we can actually judge about a digitizer are more about the technical execution. It's 
do we use too many uh, color stops? Are we jumping back and forth all the time? Are we constantly trimming? Are we inefficient? Does the travel in the design make sense so we use the least amount of jumps and trims possible so we're efficient? Are we using too many stitches, too much coverage when we should be using uh, structural underlays or something else to make the design light and run cleanly, run well without stopping and leave a nice hand on the garment? Um, certainly some of that is still a little subjective. I, I've told you guys a million times talking about patches. There are some people who really love cardboard, thick, incredibly dense patches, and some people who love lighter patches. It really depends on what you love. But for most things, for apparel decoration, you want something to have a good hand. And definitely for commercial decoration, you want something that runs cleanly, runs quickly, doesn't stop too much, doesn't cost too much time on the machine or too much time in finish work, in doing trimming and steaming and uh, every once in a while dotting something out of control with an indelible ink pen, right? <laughs> I won't tell if you won't. That's the kind of stuff we can judge, but the rest of it, you know, it's results. It's not necessary to have a degree to do this stuff. There are some lovely people I know who have wonderful degrees in design and art. Uh, I do not. My degree is unrelated entirely. I got, I got some schooling, but it's certainly not in digitizing. It's not something I took classes to do. But really, it's results that make us what we are and give us that professional tag. It's proof by doing. It is the proof of the pudding is in the eating, as it is said correctly. <laughs> But the thing is this, uh, that also means that when we're talking about rules, and I'll, I'll work on that definition again in a second, we're talking about rules, what we're really talking about is how we get results, and there are reasons why we teach rules, but there are also fully reasons to break those rules if they get the results we want, and if in getting those results, we're doing so in a way that if we're in business is profitable, if we are doing something for an artistic sense, uh, works and exists in a way that we can do that repeatably and make the thing we want to make with the textures and the shapes and the colors we want to make it. Uh, no matter what we're trying to do, it's about getting to the result in a way that is uh, possible, definable, doesn't break our equipment, and can be used to the end that we want. That's what it really is about. So there, it, there are reasons to break the rules. So we're, we're going to talk about it in a second. But as I always like to do, as we're a little bit into the show, I'm going to say hi to some of the folks who are here. I love to see my live crew here. All of you reciprocators who are here live like to say hi. So we're going to stop say hi for a few minutes. Everybody who's on the replay doesn't want to hear it. Fast forward. But everybody who's here live, you know that we're going to say hi. So all right, let's bring in some of the people who are here. Curtis has been here. Uh, hello from Kansas. Hello, Curtis. Uh, Cindy is in from Texas. Good patch making afternoon. It is always a good afternoon when we're making patches. You guys know being a, a champion of patches myself and uh, teaching patches at the upcoming Impressions Expo and working hard on the Merrily product from Brilliance, you know that I have been steeped in patches many a time and love it. So Good patch making afternoon. Carol says hello. Hi, Carol. Christine Shreve, who has an excellent show, by the way, Women in Business, every Wednesday. Go check her out. She says hi. Hi, Christine. Happy to have you in. Uh, Barb is in from North Central Minnesota. Hi, Barb. Happy to see you again. Ramona, awesome digitizer herself, is in. Don is in. Checking in from the beach on vacation. Oh, man. Get that vacation in, Don. Glad to see you here, but don't feel bad if you got to run and go catch some waves, buddy. Don, happy to have you there. Uh, Pam is in. Hi, Pam. And we have some other folks. By the way, I love this. Pam says, what rules? Yeah, I know, right? I'll define that a little bit better. <laughs> I'll define that a little bit better. But yeah, what rules? Ultimately, yeah, results are the rules. And we can talk about that in a second, for sure. Uh, Christine's also in saying uh, something I think is really great. Uh, I think the best teachers are the ones who have broken the rules. Uh, flexibility is necessary in any creative pursuit. Yeah. And we also don't go any further in any pursuit. We don't go any further in developing our own techniques or technology if we don't have that flexibility. That's just the truth. Uh, we can continue to do things in a standardized way. And honestly, here's the thing. We need to learn the standards. If you'd heard me talk about standardization before, there is a point to learning the standards. In fact, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to say it anyway. Why do I teach things like up, you know, a line that is more than 0.8 millimeters thick, but is less than 10 millimeters thick is a good thing we can use a satin stitch for. Can we use other stitches in that place? Absolutely, we can. It's a great use case for a satin stitch. Can we make a satin stitch over 10 millimeters wide? Depending on your machine and your setup and how much tolerance you have for it running slow, yes, you can. The reason why we do that is because those are solid technical rules that allow you to get results that work reliably without tweaking, without occasional failure, and when we're not on the edge of doing more than the materials that we're using will put up with. 
that's part of the thing. As we get closer to the edge of what's possible technically, we end up with more higher failure rates and more likelihood of damages or losses or rejects. That is one of the things that's true. We can get to a point where we're using really wide stitches. They're easier to snag. You're going to have more returns from people saying stuff's coming unraveled. The wider the stitches are, if they're being used in a context where they're going to get snagged a lot. You guys have heard me tell the story umpteenth times about uh, getting a job entirely, a, a whole series of jobs from a construction company, from contractors who came to us saying that their last embroiderer had all of the letters falling off of the jet backs of their jackets and they were upset. Turns out they were using very standard rules-based widths on satin stitches, but the long wide satin stitches were getting hung up on stucco and building materials and landscaping and shredding coming apart. They came to me and despite the fact that the lettering is smaller than I would usually use a fill for, I changed all their stuff to either auto split satin, so length limit stitching, or fill stitches with a nice tight satin stitch border so they look nice and clean. And they lay flatter and they hold tighter and it's easier not to snag multiple stitches so they don't come undone. So we got that entire set of jobs and people came to us repeatedly with that order, with orders from that company because we listened to what was being done in context. And frankly, even though that's kind of a weird little rule to change, we broke a rule. We weren't using the kinds of stitches that were normal for that kind of use. Did the previous shop do anything wrong? Absolutely not. That was a great place to use satin stitches for just about anybody else who wasn't going to beat those jackets up that badly. Nothing wrong with that order. Uh, unfortunately, I think the one thing they did do, which is a bad thing they did, they did, probably the wrong rule to break, is they didn't listen to the customer when they were telling them what was happening. If you get defensive over something that's really happening, the, the customer's bringing those in and they just said, you're abusing the jackets instead of how can we avoid this next time? Provide a solution and you're doing better. But yeah, let's go to some of the other comments before we finish up. But yeah, sincerely, part of the thing is rules are guidelines. We'll get there. Rules are guidelines to help us get to the best result faster and to get a reliable result without having to guess. It is getting you through the parts of the kind of guessing, the trial by error that usually people have to do when they learn. That's why you teach rules. But these rules become foundational for an understanding that lets you stretch beyond them. If you understand why the rules are, if you understand, like I'm always kind of, I hate to say I'm on the soapbox teaching you guys every week. If you understand how one stitch works and how stitches interact with each other, like when we talked about stitch interactions just recently, we can then take the knowledge of how the stitches work and hold up. And we can then use that knowledge to go beyond it, to stretch, to stretch the definitions that we have to push the envelope on what we're doing especially if we are aware of what will happen when we go outside of those rules. But all right, let's, let's go to some more here. Uh, Cindy says, depends on what rules, some you cannot break. Hey, physical rules? No, there are rules of physics. There are rules of, of nature that you're not going to be able to break. But the thing is, a lot of the things that we consider rules are actually more guidelines. Like I said, it's something that sometimes changes as we go. And here's the other thing. I'm going to talk about this again in a second. Rules change over time because the things that the context in which they live changes over time. We'll talk about that. Uh, Lyndon is in from North Carolina. Good afternoon, Lyndon. Happy to have you in. Anton is in from Romania. Uh, thank you for being in, Anton. Thank you for listening on YouTube. Glad to have you. Just is in from Sweden. Hi. Bill's in says, uh, here's a good one, personal stuff. Uh, this isn't a rule, but before I started embroidery at all, I'd read a thousand times to learn the machine first, then maybe learn to digitize. I think it's good to learn both at the same time. Yeah, no, and I'm somebody who said that before. Uh, that I think operators make the best digitizers. You can totally learn both at the same time. I will say this, I think uh, being on a machine and running one, instead of going the other direction entirely, same time I, I still think is fine. I think being on a machine and running one before digitizing is fantastic. Doesn't mean you have to run it forever, but being on one and knowing how it works before is great. The more time you spend on it, the more you understand material interactions. What I have a hard time is people who digitize without ever having seen or touched or felt the machine or, or actually seen the interaction of all the pieces working together. But yeah, learn them at the same time. You totally can. Um, I kind of had to. I wasn't very far along in my career before I did it. I will say, though, that uh, I'm happy, though, that I had run, that I was an operator on big machines before I ran them because I was a little bit more aware of how they worked and how they functioned. But yeah, not a problem. You can break rule. Thing is, Bill, you've done the work. You're there. You can make a product work. 
proof is it like i said proof of the pudding is in the eating if you can make it work you can make it work uh tracy says hi hi tracy chuck's in hi chuck regina is in hi regina glad to see you here carolyn is in as well hello carolyn earth is in from louisiana hi earth happy to have you here and here's jeff in from the house of garb washington courthouse ohio happy to have you in jeff and Carolyn says rule breaker. Love it. Yeah. Carolyn is a massive rule breaker. She runs on all sorts of materials and all sorts of conventions. And that's awesome. So I do like it. And Ramona. Yeah, I agree with this. She says, I agree with Christine, but I think before you can expand your flexibility, you need to know and understand the basics. Yes. Foundational information is critical. This is also why when I talk about the ways that we learn uh, digitizing, right? The ways that we learn digitizing, the way we learn embroidery, um, invariably digitizers, a lot of folks when they first come in get super hung up on software information. Uh, how do I push this button to get this kind of stitch? How do I draw in my software? And they don't get hung up on embroidery information, the knowledge of embroidery, the knowledge of stitches, the knowledge of materials. And that stuff is the foundation. Understanding how embroidery works, the forces that are happening in embroidery before you worry about uh, key commands and stuff. Yes, you're going to learn it all at the same time. What I'm going to say is I think it is prime to understand how stitches work and how they come together before you worry too very much about very specific uh, execution points, before you necessarily worry incredibly about uh, specific things to software. Yes, you're going to have to learn them to touch digitizing at all. But I think the thing that is most important is that foundational knowledge. And like I said, when you're going to break a rule, the best thing you can do is have the foundations to understand how embroidery works, how stitches affect fabric, how stitches affect each other, and how the individual stitch uh, acts under tension, the stresses that it's under, and how it deforms our garments, and how they come together, and why things go wrong. I mean, that kind of stuff is foundational knowledge. Knowing embroidery and then knowing execution, I think, is more important than knowing software. Will you have to do all at the same time? Absolutely, you probably will. But the thing that should be prime in my mind is knowing embroidery. And that's the thing I'd say. Pam says, great idea. Glad to hear that, Pam. <laughs> Uh, we have can't wait to get to the point that we wisely break embroidery rules. Yeah, I, honestly, this is something that we always have to do. Um, we have to understand when to break them the correct way. And that's in business, too. I'm going to talk about some business rules. But for sure, that is part of the thing that we have to do. You know, we have to understand that um, there are embroidery rules that are there that make sense. But if we can get to the understanding of how things work, when we go to break the rules or push the envelope is really a better way to put it, in my opinion. When we go to push the envelope, we'll understand that. We'll understand that the way we're pushing the envelope is either safer or less safe, that there is more potential or less potential for problems, and that we can then get to that point of pushing past those rules and understanding where we are. But a lot of it is, Staying aware, understanding the basics, understanding the foundations, and understanding the context. Uh, like Chuck says here, for sure, uh, different environments call for different processes. Yeah, for sure. Sally says, hi, all very late tonight. All right. <laughs> late night for you. Well, thanks for being here with us. And Chuck says, kind of like being an engineer without having building knowledge. Yeah, you have to know that. But what I'm going to say is if somebody is a structural engineer who knows everything about the forces that are involved in building something, they're probably more likely to be able to stretch like how long can a suspension bridge be they can get out to the edge of it better than someone who doesn't know those basics and they might be able to push the envelope i think that's what a lot of us do uh also we have a couple people here a couple last folks here uh, uh brian from new zealand hi brian happy to have you in uh, and he says i am six months in this embroidery thing i love it big noob still i am 20 years plus into it and i love it and i still feel like a big noob some days uh keep the noob mentality of letting yourself off the hook and learning new stuff and getting excited and you will never have a bad time with it all right so let's talk about breaking the rules let's actually get into it we'll show some stuff we'll talk about some examples and i will give you some stories from my own career as well as talking about what other folks do in this space and i'll keep taking comments keep taking questions and uh discuss the kind of things that are going on but happy to have you all here and happy to have your experiences be part of this discussion because that's the best thing we can do when we discuss these things and share them together we arrive at truths that are a little bit bigger than we often get by ourselves that we get in an echo chamber so breaking the rules, I call this breaking the rules because I think it's sometimes fun that we think of this as transgressive. I think people like to talk about breaking the rules because they want to be transgressive. They want to do something that someone told them not to do. And I get it, 
right? Breaking the rules feels a little more edgy than than saying you're pushing the envelope, maybe. The truth of the matter is a lot of the times when I'm listening to people talk about the rules or when people are trying to enforce rules on folks, well-meaning people who've been taught by someone something that is useful but shouldn't be a gate to slam in their face. That's usually what I'm seeing, right? We're talking about breaking the rules. The problem is most of the time that someone tells me about something that is a rule, that is an absolute unchangeable rule in their mind, they're actually rules of thumb. Now, before because this term has some baggage to it, there's a folk etymology that leads that talks about something violent with rules of thumb, and it's actually not true at all. When someone talks about a rule of thumb, first I'll just say the meaning of a rule of thumb is a kind of useful but imprecise measurement. Uh, and that's what people kind of have come to say. A rule of thumb is a general rule that can get you close enough, right? But what it actually started out in its usage, and I've got a good kind of example of this. Um, we're talking about a fairly early sermon. We're talking about 1685 when this is used. It's from a Scottish preacher that he uses the term, and this is what makes sense. He says, uh, uh, he talked about he was talking about people saying saying that they were like foolish builders who build by guess and by rule of thumb, not by square and rule, meaning that they measure things with their, with their thumb instead of using a ruler or a square to make sure that they're absolutely correct. So when we talk about a rule of thumb, it's a rule that is just, it's useful maybe, it can help you get close, but it's not very precise. And I think that's kind of a better way to think of a lot of these rules. So when we're talking about breaking the rules, a lot of the times what we're really doing is doing a little bit more than the rule of thumb that you've been given says is possible, right? Rules of thumb are useful. If we know about how much we can do in any given area, if we know about what kind of stabilization is necessary for a certain kind of material, if we know about how fast a machine can run under certain circumstances, if we know about how wide a satin stitch can be in a certain circumstance, it's good to know that stuff. It keeps us from going too far. It's a rule of thumb. It says, hey, if you want to fill an area that's more than, say, 10, 13 millimeters wide, it's a good chance to use a, a fill stitch to do so. Is that the only way to cover an area wider than that with stitches? Absolutely not. Of course it's not. But it's a good rule of thumb that gets you close. So most of the time we're talking about breaking the rules, we're actually talking about moving a slightly beyond or outside of these rules of thumb. And most of the rules that people like me will give you when you're first starting out, when I'm trying to teach somebody in there, you can think of it as the 101 version of digitizing, the entry level digitizing, I'm going to try and tell you what kind of stitches to use for what kind of shapes. Why am I going to do that? You can go back a couple episodes and you'll hear me say it. But why am I telling you that and telling you that despite the fact that it can go differently? I mean, I always tend to show you something that's a little bit beyond that as a teaser of going beyond those rules of thumb. But why do we tell you that is so that you get a result that works right out of the gate. The problem is without these rules of thumb, people do things like they grab a vector shape, they throw it into their digitizing software and they think, I want a smooth looking stitch. I don't want one that looks like a filling stitch. They don't know what it is. I want a smooth looking stitch. And they grab a really complex shape that has, it's really wide, that has all sorts of projections off of it. And they apply a satin stitch to it, which will automatically split or break or do something ugly. And they don't know any better. They have a single angle that crosses the whole weird, complicated vector shape they've brought in. They have no compensation. They drop a satin stitch on it, and it looks terrible. It runs terrible. It bunches up. It has a lot of tension on it. It's because they don't have this rule of thumb. Could they have used satins as part of a way to fill that instead of a fill stitch? Absolutely, they could. Would a fill stitch lay flatter and look better on a complex shape like that? It very much would. But beyond those rules of thumb are where we get into artistic textures and, and you know, carving and cool things that are slightly beyond. That's why I always call, a, I have a class called Demystifying Next Level Digitizing, and it's for doing that. It's for breaking up shapes. It's for doing more than is obvious right in front of you. That's good use of the rule of thumb, is to say about this wide, we use this stitch. If we're on this material, we use this kind of stabilizer and it works. If we are doing business in this way, we charge this much, uh, up, you know, upkeep, we charge this much setup, we charge this much markup on a garment of this kind. These rules of thumb are good. They per they keep you from doing just randomly out of pocket stuff that doesn't work at all. However, 
people sometimes take those rules of thumb and treat them as gospel. They treat them as something that's absolutely unbreakable and can't be changed. When the truth of the matter is, well, rules change. Over time, things change that make the rules change. Uh, certainly, materials improve and change. I'm going to talk a little bit about that with 3D foam. The 3D foam that I started working on is not the 3D foam we have now. The rules from then are not the rules from now, and I'll describe that in more detail. Um, technologies change. There are ways of doing things now that we couldn't have done before. Uh, certainly, a lot of the technology stays the same. The, the stitch that we use in embroidery is the same interlock stitch that has been around from the first sewing machine that runs like a modern interlock machine. It has been over, it's hundreds of years really since it was originally developed as a thing at all. And it's been in operation all that time and very similar. However, technologies change. There was a time where there was no such thing as color reel. Color reel may have a lot to answer for before it's useful commercially, but it does let you lay down a gradient inside of a fill stitch fairly precisely in whatever the heck color you want. That certainly changes the, the possibility of digitizing gradients and makes it a different thing. Even if it doesn't do everything we might imagine it could do, it certainly changes what's possible. Uh, the advent of wide availability of a lot of materials and things that can be uh, sold to you in the heat transfer world, in the heat printing world, the fact that you can go to a craft store right now and buy something that lets you uh, do sublimation at home pretty readily right now. Is it perfect? Maybe not. Is it possible? Yes, it is. It changes the access to technology. It changes what the best choices are for certain things. And it certainly changes what's possible at all, especially in the world of either craft or art versus commercial stuff. Because commercial stuff still has to work on efficiencies, still has to work with profit margins. But even that changes because new business models arise. Absolutely, there are new business models that arise and old business models fall off. If you told somebody you could invest forever in flat bill snapback trucker hats in a previous time, there was a time between the last rise and the current rise that those things didn't happen. There was an entire period of time where no one would be caught dead bending the bill of a cap. Now I've seen a person online selling his own invention that curves cap bills perfectly that started out from a 3D printed original these markets change. So in business, these markets change. And can that affect us in digitizing and embroidery? Absolutely. I have lived through more than one iteration of decoration getting simpler. Uh, we had a, a period of decoration where everything was tonal, tone on tone, very low stitch counts. And if you were only buying things or selling things by stitch count and you had no other way of making money, you were losing during that period of time because just to get something on the machine, took enough time that the low stitch count, small decorations that were popular for that couple of years really weren't making you enough money if that's the only way you were charging. Business models change. They drop off and new ones come about. There are times where we have more decoration and times we have less. Then there was the kind of the norm core thing that happened where we had dad hats with really small logos on them and corporate logos that looked like old school, early 90s stuff. And that happened fairly recently. And during that, there was a lot of people doing very small decorations on unstructured hats. If you had keyed up everything about your business to do massive 3D foam flat, uh, you know, flat build hats. And then suddenly we have a bunch of these unstructured hats and you had never touched one before and your entire business model is built around them. You'd have to either make sure you stay with that market or you'd have to learn some new stuff and change your business model. The rules for what was profitable change. And funny enough, yes, even when we're talking about digitizing, even when we're talking about embroidery, materials change, technologies change, and ultimately rules change because they aren't the same forever. And the way we go about things isn't the same forever, depending on the access to stuff. Uh, the access to equip, different equipment for cutting, the access to, like I said, different equipment for heat printing, different materials for heat printing, different materials for embroidery, different ma support materials that are available, changes how we do things and it changes our recommendations over time. And I'll admit that I change my classes over time with how new things come up. And I can talk about that. So let's see, we got a couple of comments here too. and. Uh, Let's see what else we have going on here. Uh, Marta says, glad to catch you live while waiting to attend Lisa's advanced stitch artist class. Hey, give Lisa my best. Uh, Lisa Shaw teaching an advanced stitch artist class, digitizing in Houston, Texas, doing a great work. And she always does awesome stuff for education and getting that one-to-one -one in attention in. So good on you. Uh, Carolyn says, I have done your flower design. Oh, here's one. Here's breaking a rule. Uh, I have a design that is a uh, dogwood flower. It's done all in engraving style. I'll bring it up in a second if I can. Um, but 
I've done a design and I, I gave this to Carolyn some long time ago and she scaled it way beyond what it what you would normally say is okay because of the nature of the design. Uh, I've done your flower design as small as 1.5 inches and up to 11 inches. Your schooling has taught me so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad to hear that. The thing about that is it's one of those rules. You can only scale 25%. If you understand what the stitches are doing, if you know what your longest stitch can be and run well in a given uh, in a given setting on a given context or garment, if you know what your smallest stitch is and how it can run well, you can then look at the relationship between stitches or groups of stitching, and you can grow and shrink in larger increments than that, provided you have, let's say, a working file or, or a a software that pr processes stitches and you understand what will happen. Knowing the foundations lets you do that. And I'll, like I said, I'll try and bring up the uh, piece I'm talking about real quick that she had discussed, because why not? I think it's fun to give you actual examples. Yeah, it, you can do more than you might think. And I'll go ahead and grab that. Uh, let's go ahead and share our other screen so you can see it real quick. But yeah, here's the design that we're talking about. This is the design that uh, Carolyn's talking about, right? And I think, I think she actually reviewed the piece and she did it on multiple different things. She stitched that and her stuff before. But if we look at that dogwood flower design, right? This dogwood flower design, fairly simple. It is a uh, very much an engraving style design, a botanical style design. The thing that will happen with designs like this is as you expand them, they will look less dense. If you scale them up, they look less dense. If you scale them down, the shortest stitches, the smallest stitches, unless you're filtering them out, can get tight. We can get excess density. Density goes up as we scale down. Density goes down as we scale up. But uh, this is one of those pieces where it is one of the simplest pieces I've ever done. And multiple people think it's like their favorite piece of mine, which cracks me up. It was something that I absolutely did as a throwaway. I did this just for fun, randomly, and didn't really think much of it. Um, it's over at theonlystitch.com if you want to grab one. But sincerely, you can do a lot if you understand what's going to happen. If you don't mind that the density inside of, inside of these little areas gets lighter, that the coverage is a little less, that it's not as dark inside the shading, you can scale it up and understand what's going to happen. And in fact, if you measure between these doubled lines, you can see how dense, how light these pieces can get. You know, that's what it is. It's if you understand what will happen when you scale, if you understand the ramifications of your actions, you can do more. Should you only scale 15, 25%? Most logos, yes. Most complicated things that have outlines on them that have to register, the chances are you will be badly served by scaling too much. On a piece like this, it's up to how you want the result to be. A lighter stitching result with thinner lines scale it up. No big deal. Just look at how long the longest stitches are in this piece. In this case, there are very few long stitches. And I think you could double this thing without much trouble. You would just have a much lighter, less dense version of the shading. But you have to know that to know that, right? You know the rule of thumb. Why is the rule of thumb there that we don't upscale or downscale more than 15 to 25%? Because when we're talking about things like uh, bordered fills or little straight stitch borders that are on satin stitch pieces, the compensation for pull and push is probably tuned to the size and the material that it's supposed to be on. If you scale it much beyond that, you might have problems. But I've broken this rule myself, even on a complex design, and I'll talk to you about that. But I'm gonna have to bring this, this is so great. Christine has a wonderful comment. So thank you, Christine, for this one. Um, a wonderful quote. So here's our quote. Uh, Learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. Attributed to Pablo Picasso. Yeah, fantastic. That's the idea. If we learn, those rules of thumb, that's great, but we can thoroughly break them in the service of doing something more than the usual and in the service of doing what we want to do, provided we understand what will happen when we break them or we're willing to pay the price. And we'll put that in quotes too. You can pay the price of breaking the rules and that's pretty interesting, right? And by the way, Carolyn says just that, the goal in the large famine was lighter than it was beaded to fill the areas. See, it's awesome. You are using it to a purpose. That's the thing. We can break the rules to a purpose. And also when we're talking about rules of thumb, they're not rules at all. What are rules of thumb? Uh, I think the best way to put it, hey, rule of thumb, what is really a rule of thumb? Rule of thumb is a guideline. Rules of thumb are there to help you get somewhere where you get a result. It's a guideline. It helps you get somewhere. It helps you do what you want to do. It's not there to limit what you want to do. It's here to there to help you get there. Um, so let's start with some digitizing rules of thumb for fun. Like I said, I'm going to have lots of these that we'll discuss as we're going on. One we already discussed is scaling designs. 
Can you scale designs out of a certain size? Absolutely, you can. In fact, let's go ahead and show you my example. I was going to talk about scaling designs. And uh, let's share my screen. We, I've got a gallery to share some stuff with you so we can kind of show what I'm talking about. There's multiple things here that are in that rule of thumb. But here's one I've talked about before that I think uh, for me is kind of the epitome of breaking those rules. And I don't want to. Uh, let's go ahead and just grab this guy here. The Gilly Loco Salsa Jacket Back, right? So here are my conditions. I have to make something for uh, a promotional event and it has to be done very quickly. We have sub 24 hours to get jackets done, high-end jackets that they are bringing us customer supplied and it needs to be done immediately so that these can be delivered to a party. So here's the piece. Gilly Loco Salsa that has this wonderful little chameleon fi figure in it. Uh, and as you can see, we're doing a lot of applique here and we've got some satin stitch text on it. And as we get closer, we've got some fill stitches. We're using some interesting creative uses of applique here. This is a material that is not necessarily meant for applique. This is upholstery material, but it is something that can work for jackets and can be laundered, what have you. But here's the, the big dirty secret of the Gilly Loco Salsa piece that I've shown you guys over and over to talk about the creative use of applique. The dirty secret about the Gilly Loco Salsa piece is that this is a left chest scaled up to an entire jacket back. So let me let that soak in for a minute. Where I tell you don't do that necessarily, I was number one, What are, is it the best rendition? No. When I look at this, there's some stuff that I find sloppy. Some of these thick lines in here should be refined. They are not exactly what I'd want to see. Uh, some of the corners are not the best. There's a little bit of tight spacing in here that I probably could have adjusted, but I had a very small amount of time to get this thing from the design that we had into the format we needed to stitch all of the pieces in time for delivery. So what did I do? I looked at the design and I said, all right, what's gonna cause me trouble? What are the things that I, that I can and can't get away with? First thing, this design originally had a satin bordered fill behind the Gilly Loco text. Gilly Loco text was in satin stitches broken up into strokes, so that was gonna have to be replaced, but I had the original artwork, so I've got a, a vector copy of their artwork I can work from and I can put those letters back in and get those vector shapes. Might not be able to do a lot of work on them, but I'd ha I have that there. When I looked at the lettering for salsa, which was already in satin stitches, I said, you know what? None of those are going to be problematic. The be spicy, my friends stuff. I looked at the stitches and I'm like, maybe they're not ideal, but none of this is going to cause much of a problem. There's a little bit of sawtoothing because the sampling material was really coarse, but no big problem. Other things I looked at and, and were problematic. Uh, the line on the top of the hat here, that line was in straight stitches. So I rendered it as a satin column using the same path that was there because I wanted it to be a little thicker. Uh, these pieces back here were straight satins and some of them were lighter density fills. I made them a little more dense because I was going to run on this material. Uh, and I changed those to automatic splits and random splits so that we got some texture, but we didn't have big, long, weird stitches on the parts that were originally satins. And this was usually a fill. I dropped out the fill and I thickened up the outline a little bit and set up the placement and tack down stitches and cut lines that I would require to do applique. I made cut lines from the original design that was here. I used those lines to create cut lines for a plotter cutter. I used some magic mask and stuck that down to my upholstery material and cut it on a normal vinyl cutter, which was not pleasant, but was possible. And I made this into an applique design. Same thing here, dropped the fill out from the background and used an applique to speed up the time. So why could I take this design? I know I'm zooming all in and out. I get, I get criticism for that. I, I zoom in and out a lot. But what I'm going to say is the final result looked good. Why did it look good? I looked at the things that were going to cause trouble. The widest stitch, I looked at the widest satin stitch and it was not too wide for a satin stitch. And it was fine, especially because some of those wide satin stitches were going to be on the edges of applique. Excellent. I've got some slop in case things don't really line up exactly how I want to. Uh, some of the other stitches that did have to change, the little narrow stitches on the hat had to change. So I made them into a satin that was going to be bolder and hold up under some scrutiny. Wasn't going to look bad. I looked at the rest of the way these things were done for... Um, pull compensation. And honestly, even after I scaled them up, small adjustments to the pull comp were all it took to make it happen. Would I ever recommend that the right way to get yourself a jacket back is to go to your left chest and scale it? Absolutely not. Even looking at this piece, which is a successful piece, which I have shown people and taught from, I still see things that I would have done better if I had digitized it at this scale from the get-go. However, I did turn this design around in the space of a day and deliver. The results matter, and the customer was very, very happy with it. Sam and in fact, the sample doesn't look as good as the final piece because we did some work on uh, how the applique was cut for the centerpiece, and we did a little bit of work on some of the placement stitching and the tack down that made it look a little nicer and a little less ripply. 
But what I'm going to say is, ultimately, is this a successful piece? Yes, it solved the problem that was there. It made the customer happy. They were overjoyed with the texture of this um, of this textured uh, faux snakeskin material that was here in the middle of the uh, of the lizard. All of those things worked, and I broke the rules. But I broke the rules with a solid understanding of the foundation of the rules of thumb that were underlying them, right? So that's one of the first rules we talk about, right? Scaling. Uh, work at scale. Don't overscale things. Well, yes, excepting when you have those kind of things set up. Number one, I had the working file. I had created the original file. When I rescaled it, I was going to get a perfect representation of the densities that I set, and I could make small adjustments as I needed to. I checked my longest stitch and shortest stitch. Longest stitch made sense uh, where the adjustments were done. There were no short stitches that got too long and would have been obnoxious or didn't look the way I wanted them to. When I did have something that was going to change thickness too much, straight stitches that I used running as a double running stitch up, up there in the top of the hat, I changed it to a satin stitch because I knew I wanted something thicker. I understood what was going to happen that when I rescaled that, the straight stitch was going to stay the same thickness no matter what I did to it no matter how I scaled it I was going to have to alter it to make that happen however made the best out of a bad situation the piece was there the results work so did I break the rules I broke a rule of thumb I went beyond a guideline I stretched beyond what you are told to do what I would tell you to do the thing is that is a rare case where not too much needed to be changed and I did so with an immediate understanding of the things that I was changing if you come to embroidery brand new and you say, do I have to buy two different sizes of things? And you get unhappy that you have to have something done for um, left chest and jacket back. That's the problem. It's when someone has something that is also more detailed. If we look at that piece one more time, and I'll go ahead and bring that up. Why, you know, why not? We'll bring it up one more time and say, if you look at this piece, yes, there are some details there. No, it's not heavily detailed. It's very much a cartoon-like piece, a coloring book type piece. It has thick borders around it. There are solid slabs of color. There are some small uh, bits of shading in it. Nothing that's too incredibly detailed. And honestly, it's not showing up great in this picture. I think maybe some of the detailed pictures show it uh, a little bit better. So I can pop back up and see if I can see it here uh, just a touch better. There are some little bits of darker green shading that the, unfortunately, the reflection from the flash on the camera, the, the lights on the camera made it a little too hot. There is that stuff there, but none of this is really intimately detailed. It's not likely to fall apart. A super detailed logo with lots of different colors and shapes that are all jammed together that have to register to each other is going to have a lot harder time with scaling. And if you start from a small design and scale up, there's detail that doesn't exist in the small design and now will not be there when you scale up. If you start from a large design and go small when there's tons of detail, there are tightly packed details in that big design that when they get shrunken down are going to be too tightly packed to run well and they're going to be too dense and cause thread breaks and jamming and uh, knots on the back of your garment. It's knowing the basics that lets you break the rules, but the rules are not immutable. You can definitely change them. Rules change, context change. Uh, one of the other ones that I, I kind of always bring up here too, um, this is something about teaching and 3D foam is a big one. 3D foam has changed over time. When I used to teach 3D foam, invariably I would talk about stitch types. And I still show this. It was a design that someone showed me. It was one of my, uh, my uh, audience who brought this up. Here is a design run on one piece of foam and using this foam, the fill stitch smashed down the stitches way more than the satin. And when I used to teach, I told people don't use fill stitch, use satins. When we were teaching this and when I taught this the very first time, I was teaching with the original low density foams that were available at the time. They were the soft foams. They were like craft foam and they crushed down really readily. And this is what I teach now. I show that foam anyway. I show people that because when they use multicolor foams, a lot of them are the lower density foam, whereas the high density foams usually only come in a couple different colors. But with high density foams, you can use a fill stitch over foam. It's not a problem. So the old rule was all 3D foam designs must be satin stitches to get a high crown on them. The new rule is we have higher density foams. And if you use the right settings, you can totally make a fill stitch stand up a close to the same height as a satin. Is a satin going to give you a higher crown? Absolutely. Is it still the gold standard for making big blocky letters that are, look great in foam? Absolutely. Um, does it look like it used to when we we're using one layer of three millimeters soft foam, the kind of stuff like you might see in a craft store? No, that stuff doesn't look the same as this. Higher density foams can now hold up to more of that tension. And also we now have machines, like I said before, technologies change, right? Technologies change. 
we now have machines that have feet that can be raised or that automatically raise or that have digital uh, adjustments available, either manual or digital adjustments for the presser feet that don't crush down on the foam as much, where we can do different, different kind of ways to handle the cycle. Some people will literally change the timing on the machine to make 3D foam just perfect. Um, you can do different things to get there now. Times change, technologies change, materials change. So the rules change when we're doing it. And I'll say some of the other stuff that happens. I mean, we, like I said, the very first one, always use X stitch type for lines or areas of X or Y width. Uh, the one that I talked about before, this is another similar one. I'll just bring this image up again. It's one you've seen me talk about before. Uh, we're saying we want durable garments. This was done for a motorcycle club. These letters are only, you know, maybe six to eight millimeters tall on the small side. Uh, they're not really big, some of them. Oh, actually, these are the larger set, sets. There's three sets of letters on this piece. There's a medium set of letters, the smallest set of letters, which are only a few millimeters tall. Those suckers were all done with a auto split satin. These ones, which totally could have been done with satin stitches, the strokes in this are between, like I said, eight and 12 mils anywhere in here. You could use satins on them. You could use even auto split satins or a split satin if you wanted to have a defined line. But because this is going on a motorcycle club, they were very much into having their stuff durable and they had the same kind of complaints as those contractors did. They wanted them to be very durable, very tight, and they also wanted it to be a little uh, less flashy, less shiny. And so even though we went with polyester thread, we did a fill stitch with a, a slim, tight satin border. And if you look at even this decorative piece that's coming off the bottom of this Old English, we have this decorative curly cue. Even in that, you can see that there's a split down the center of that satin to keep it really nice, flat, and tight. Is this what I would usually do with a piece of lettering of this size? No, I don't have that other example of the smallest lettering, but in this case, it still plays out. So you can see it in the curly cue. Yeah, is that what I would always do? No, that's too many stitch penetrations. It's usually something I wouldn't wanna do. Um, does it run okay? Absolutely, it doesn't run problematically. The density is good. Everything's set up to a point where we're not getting any sort of um, hangups or thread breaks or anything like that. And the customer wants a less shiny material and a rendition that's not going to snag easily or wear out easily. So this is a really good option for durability. It's a good option for the context, but most customers probably don't want this. At this size, and especially the smaller size pieces I did that were also had broken up stitch lengths, they would probably want satin. Any normal digitizer not given any direction about the context or about what the customer wants would probably render these as satins. However, in the context of what we're doing, it made sense to render those as fills because of the context, because of what people asked for. One of those rules, use a satin stitch for some sort of width, use a fill stitch for a certain width. And the fill stitch one, you guys have seen this piece a million times too, but this is another one. Uh, this is a full size jacket back. There's a huge area of coverage in the back of the main. Could I have used a fill stitch to do this? Absolutely. When I looked at the rest of the textures that were being creative, uh, by these other kinds of loose bits of hair around the ears, these tufts on the ears. I could not, in good conscience, at least for me, as an artistic rendition, just put a big block of nondescript fill behind the head. So I made a bunch of little satin stitches that cover together that are overlapped in order to create this texture, in order to create this final look. I got the coverage using overlapped satin stitches. Does it add some more tension to the piece? Yes. Uh, was it so much on a stable jacket that it made trouble for me? No, stitch count was actually lower than if I had used a fill stitch in the same size with the settings that are usual for me to that kind of a piece. And overall, I ended up with a faster run, but it had a little bit more tension, a little bit more pull on the piece than if it were a fill. This is once again, technically breaking the rules. If I'm going by the rule of thumb about how wide an area should be and what I should fill it with, uh, this is breaking the rules. But the funny thing is, this is actually a bit of a throwback. Lots of old school designs were done in such a way that they used multiple overlapped satins for filling. I remember uh, distinctly a lot of the pieces that I looked at early on in my career, because I'm, I'm somebody who likes to look at embroidery as much as I like to make it. Uh, I saw tons of early patches that were done and also tons of pieces that were done on uh, zigzag style machines, right? So we're talking about the Meistergram, the old school Meistergram style machines, not the modern ones that did everything as horizontal zigzag stitches. Well, those by the very nature of them, they fill the areas with overlapped zigzags pretty frequently. Same thing with a lot of hand guided work. You're not getting 
a brickwise fill stitch, a tatami style fill stitch out of those machines, either in handwork generally or in using those zigzag style machines, what you're getting is overlapped satin stitches. It's only with the advent of the more modern machine and with the advent of digitizing software the way we have it now with fully computerized control that we have fill stitches quite like we do. Certainly, certainly fill stitch has been around for a very long time. However, uh, even when they're single, singly plotted, but there was an era where other types of machines and other types of embroidery didn't use them so much or at all. And that's the thing. Rules change. I'm sure there's a period of time where somebody is showing you a piece that is made for that historical, like I said, the military, those historical military patches I was talking about, where there were guidelines for those patches that showed you exactly how far you should overlap those satin stitches. And that's the only way they were made. And I'm betting you for uh, any of those marks that still stick around, those patches that are still around today, a lot of those overlap satin areas are probably are fill stitches now in a lot of renditions the rules change about what's done and it really has to do with what's available for the tools and the technology and what's popular now too that can also be the look that becomes popular it's just how it is then when you're exposed to lots of different kinds of embroidery and like i said a million times i think you should uh, consume broadly and create with focus when you're exposed to all different kinds of needlework embroidery mark making and design you see these rules being used differently and it makes a difference to what you will do right to how you will work so one of the other ones too, uh, just a simple one, uh, cap designs can only be X millimeters tall or how many inches tall. That's where they work best, especially complicated cap designs, especially ones that have a lot of registration in multiple colors. We have a vertical limit and it changes from hat to hat, but there is a limit to where it's going to be easy and not distort and not have problems. However, you know, unless your machine says no, if you're on, like there's machines, I know the, the Brother Entrepreneur series, those machines, those kind of uh, the, the home market machines that are a little more limited in their scope, they may have a literal physical limit where there's absolutely no way. Uh, commercial machines tend to be a little more forgiving about those limits on their hat gauges, their, their cap gauges, their hat uh, frames. But there is a little bit of wiggle room beyond that limit, depending on the hat. And uh, the thing that I always think about with that is this one particular piece I did. And like I said, it's about knowing what's possible and what it will work. This is one of the pieces. Here we are on an unstructured hat. This has, you know, unstru completely unstructured dad hat style. And we are running a design that is absolutely way larger than I would ever recommend. This thing is very easily three inches tall and it is way up into the crown. The eyelets are underneath it. It goes up past it. The thing is, it does distort a little bit. It is not a perfect design. However, when the design is a single color, when there are no outlines to register, and when we aren't up in the top of that area working for a long period of time, when we can work in a way that smooths it out by getting the interior skull kind of done first, the look is fine. The result is fine. Would I do this if I had a bunch of small engraving style work up in the top that all had to register with outlines, like tiny outline lettering? Absolutely not. For a big slab of a design like this, that the only complication is between a couple different stitch types and textures, uh, this really is not a problem. I've got a lot of slop. I have a lot of room to overlap, and it's not going to cause issues. As long as my machine is happy to do it, as long as uh, the arm on my machine won't pop the hat off or pop the hat frame off while it's running because it's snagging up on it, as long as I'm not, I'm free to move inside of that area. You can do this. And the funny thing is, I've seen this from folks uh, running hats flat in the home market where they will smash a, a hat flat with adhesive stabilizer. The thing is, a lot of that stabilizer tends to get chewed up and not hold up to multicolor designs that have a lot of detail. But they will run these giant monograms that go way up into the crown, way up past the curve where we would never run. But on a single color monogram where it doesn't have to register, where the curvature warping things doesn't really look that bad or affect the look so much, big curly Q monogram, you'll never see it. You can run a big giant one smash flat. And as long as the stabilizer holds, it's going to be OK. Is it a rule we should establish for everything? Absolutely not. You can't do this with everything. Or at the very least, you're going to get worse and worse results up into the crown on the curve. And honestly, this being an unstructured hat was better because it was able to flatten out as it ran. Whereas doing this on a structured hat where we have this a hard bubble right here that when the machine starts dropping that presser foot right on top of that bubble in the crown uh, on a six panel, 
uh, constructed hat, it's going to cause a bunch of deflection and warping and the material is going to move around. On this hat, with this design, this is a perfectly acceptable result. Is it a good rule to tell everybody? No. Is it something that will produce a result? Yes. So that's where I, I say results matter. And I mean, it's same thing in execution. We talk about execution, we talk about digitizing, it's, it's similar stuff, but we have some execution things that I'll certainly talk about. I mean, like I said, a lot of this stuff with the digitizing is all about just the sizes of stitches, the lengths of stitches, uh, the size of the designs, the length of stitches, things like that that uh, come in together for quality. Those things can determine some of those rules. But honestly, there's more that we can do that's slightly beyond it if we want to and if we understand things. So a couple different things. We'll talk about execution briefly. So when I say execution, I mean things that happen on the machine. We certainly have some rules like that too. Uh, and I'll Let's grab comments before I jump into execution because we only have that for a while. But let's let's grab some comments first. And I, like I said, this is all about understanding what will happen when we push the envelope. Let's grab these though. Uh, Lindsay says, for someone who has been digitizing for a long time, experimenting is a big part of what keeps it fun and engaging. Tried and true has its place, but what happens outside of the usual boundaries and the magic happens. Yes, and it's also where all the fun is for those of us who have been doing this for a while too. You're correct. Um, it's also where we start to learn new techniques and new ways of putting stitches together is by doing something that's not necessarily the norm. So it's kind of it's kind of that too. Uh, Jorita says, and in brilliance, we use length limit satin. Can you achieve the auto split look? Yeah, length limit satin with a high uh, edge margin, a high margin for the edge where we don't have um, any sorts of drops in there is close to the auto split look. It's about the same type of thing. And yeah, uh, Josh Epps says 2.8 inches I've seen on the structured cap, three inches. Wow, yeah, it's huge. But at the same time, on that particular cap, that particular design, that's how it works. You know, it was fine. I wouldn't do it for something that was more detailed. I wouldn't do it for something where I had to have registration. That's just not what I would do. Um, but let's talk a little bit about that with the execution. And I know this is something that people already know. If I say some of these things that people consider rules, they're, they're immediately going to say, I, I know ways that we don't do that. And I agree with you. But I've had somebody get mad bo on both directions, either in telling somebody that there are exceptions to the rule or in someone sharing one of the ways that they've done something outside of the rules. Uh, number one on this one, uh, always use stabilizer. And I'm a proponent of stabilizer. Also, this is, this is something we'll get into in a second. Always use uh, a specific stabilizer that is either particular to the garment or embroidery specific materials. And we'll talk about that in a second. But let's start with just always using stabilizer. The thing is, why do I always say stabilizer instead of backing? I always say stabilizer instead of backing because what we want from stabilizer is to make the design stable, is to make the material stable, uh, arrest it from stretching in any one given direction and allow there to be some body to the piece while we're embroidering it, even for things where the stabilizer may be torn away or ripped or, or washed away, uh, heated away, whatever it is, we want there to be some stability. Are there times where you don't use stabilizer or where stabilizer doesn't remain in the garment? Absolutely there are. Now I know a bunch of you are gonna say it. I'm sure you've seen, uh, we all have a good friend, uh, Vitor of Vitor Digitizing. He likes to show stuff that he's doing that is way off the beat. He tries stuff way outside of the rules all the time. Watch his videos and you'll see things that you probably wouldn't wanna do with your machine. But one of the things he did recently was he's running handkerchiefs without stabilizer. And honestly, I'm looking at it, single color monograms on the corner of a handkerchief. And here's the thing he's done. He's controlled the amount of difficulty that there will be there by doing some some basic things, right? He's got a, ma a material that's not going to stretch very much. Yes, it's a little thin. He's lightened up his tensions. So we don't have as much tension on the machine. One of the good things we can also do is run rayon instead of poly. Rayon can run at less tensions, especially if you're running on something where it's okay for it. Uh, you know it's not going to be uh, subjected to heavy industrial laundry or bleaching. Handkerchief, yeah, we got some guesses there, but decorative handkerchief, very likely not to have a problem. It's a tonal design. It's a tonal color right on the handkerchief, not gonna be very visible if there's a little bit of looseness, he can lighten up densities. And he used the smallest hoop available to hoop the handkerchief corner. Using the smallest hoop available gives you the most stability in the design. So for a light stitching set of small monogram letters on a handkerchief in the smallest hoop you could possibly muster, Running that with the light tensions the way he established them without stabilizer was fine. It worked well and the results are there. Would I recommend everybody start without stabilizer in anything that doesn't stretch? No, absolutely not. Your best chance of getting a result there is to use a stabilizer. 
are there times where you run without it? Yeah. And I'll say I certainly have had several times where I ran uh, honestly fully without stabilizer. And I'll show you my very favorite thing that I run without stabilizer. Um, honestly, had to be tote bags. There are tons of tote bags that I've run where I could throw them in a clamp and stabilizer free, they ran just fine. Uh, this is one of the ones I did for my wife, and it's a custom design I did for her. It's seen slightly better days because I never took a picture until she carried it for years. So there's a little bit of fraying on some of the thread because this has been slid in and out of a, uh, you know, out of the driver's seat of the car and junked all over the university campus. So it's got some, it's got some fraying, but there's a nice little Anglo-Saxon piece where I used the, uh, the manuscript hand from Beowulf, from the, from the manuscript from Beowulf, right? So Cotton Vitellius. Uh, I used the, um, manuscript hand to create this lettering that I digitized for her. And this piece is on this incredibly tough polyester uh, material. It's really, it's woven. It does not stretch. It wears like iron. I, I clamped this up and I ran it without stabilizer. It didn't need any stabilizer. You couldn't stretch this stuff if you wanted to. It was very stable. And so as you can see, there's no pulling, there's no problems. What you might see is that the stitches ride maybe a little higher than you might expect, because to be honest with you, I didn't adjust my tensions. I threw this thing on an existing running machine, threaded it up and ran this stuff directly. Now I am gonna admit this was run with uh, Rayon. I probably shouldn't have, but she really loved the gold color, the gold and green. It went very well together. And the particular gold I had, I didn't have this gold in a uh, poly. So I think this actually is Rayon up on top. That's a Madeira 1070, a light old gold. It's a beautiful color. It's my favorite color of thread that I, I know. I love that gold because it shows the shadow and the, the turn of stitch angles so nicely. But of course, that's the thing. I knew that this was stable. Do I need stabilizer for this? Well, there were not, there were no kind of straps or anything that were going to get in the way. Nothing was going to slide on the back of the hoop and cause issues. It wasn't going to snag on the needle plate. I had a small hoop that was, or a small clamp that was inside the strap. So all I had on the back was smooth material. And truth being told, you really just didn't need stabilizer here. And frankly, I've seen people run without stabilizer in worse situations. In fact, I'm going to show you one that I've done before. I've done versions with and without, but this piece that you guys may have seen, it's a hand cut reverse applique piece, and this is jersey knit. So this is absolutely t-shirt material. There's two layers of t-shirt material with a reverse applique that I cut out of it. Um, one of the versions of this that I've done in my time playing with it, uh, I ran it without stabilizer. Um, straight stitches especially if you tune them the right way, sometimes you can do it. Did it pull or did it move around a little bit? Yes, I had it hooped nice and tight, small hoop, just inside the borders of what was possible, two layers of this jersey. Did it move around a little bit? Yes, was it critical on this distressed piece? No, and I'm also gonna tell you, I've seen people do uh, laser cut applique with a single straight stitch tacking down jersey on something slightly stiffer, some outerwear that had a little bit more body to it. And I've seen that run without stabilizer. Should we run without stabilizer all the time? Absolutely not. Can you sometimes run without it? Sometimes you can. If your machine's tuned right, if you know what's gonna happen to it, or if the small amount of distortion is not gonna cause problems. But certainly when we're talking about something like this bag that I showed you, that I did for my wife, this thing is, it's like iron. It doesn't stretch in any given direction. And because there's nothing to catch up on any of the works behind this garment, I didn't see much of a problem with it. And frankly, I ran lots of tote bags without stabilizer. Did I always? No. Sometimes I used it, especially if the tote bag didn't have the same kind of uh, dimensional strength, if it stretched. If I was doing something that was heavier, I mean, look at this design. Uh, double straight stitch runs on the bottom and on the top, we've got a, a, essentially a single satin with probably an edge run underlay on it little bit of extra pull comp on it. That's it. That's really all that's going on. There's not much to it and it doesn't have to register. Once again, it doesn't have to register. It's not going to get deformed in such a way that it won't line up correctly. And if it does, I, I didn't cut out any of the stitches that are underneath this long, st the long stemmed S that's here from the manuscript. Nothing would have happened if it moved because their stitches are underneath all of that piece. So if you moved a little bit, you wouldn't really see it because the stitches exist underneath the S. Like I said, it's not for all the time, but it's something you can do. It's not something you do for every piece. You don't run things without stabilizer all the time, but you can run without stabilizer under certain conditions. If you understand what the conditions are and what the material is there to do, you can do that. Same thing with stabilizer. People say, if you wear it, don't tear it. I know lots of you folk, 
you uh, uh, you guys out there focus on different kinds of materials. Uh, lots of you focus on uh, the kind of pieces that you don't want stuff behind. Maybe you use something different or people will tell you to use a, a cutaway and a tearaway together. And instead you use an action bag or you use woven materials for stabilizer. And some people use things that aren't marketed for stabilizer, including other kinds of fabrics as stabilizers that work. If you understand what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve, what you're focusing on, what your result is supposed to be, and you know well how it works and it's something you can repeat. That's the big thing with this stuff. Repeatability so that you can do it consistently every time. Of course, you can stretch beyond that. Uh, the difference is when you don't know and people just want to stretch beyond it because they just don't want to look at stabilizer because they only have something here. They don't want to spend the money on a nice stabilizer. So they start throwing you know, coffee filters, newspaper, whatever it is, it is behind it. If that material you're using as a stabilizer doesn't provide stability to the design, to the material that you're working on, then it's not doing its job. But does it mean that you always, always, always have to use uh, X stabilizer with Y fabric or always have to use stabilizer? No, it's the same thing. I teach hooping as the primary way. Lots of people in the home market used to like to float a lot, which is to stick things down, pin them down, base them down. But for me, it was always hoop your garment. Are there things that I don't hoop? Absolutely. There are certain kinds of bags that won't work, collar tips, straps on the back of hats, Velcro straps, things that you stick down reliably. And honestly, things like pre-made patch blanks. Of course, I'm not hooping it. It's very unlikely that I will use, um, unless you're doing massive amounts of these things, you will not have a hoop or a frame that's going to hold them. Do they exist? Yes, but they're for standard shapes and sizes. For anything non-standard, where I want to use a pre-edged blank and then stitch something on it, I'm going to stick it down and run it. So always hoop your garments a great rule, but it's not one you use all the time. And now, honestly, there's several different kinds of rules like that that kind of come up. Uh, the other thing is always use embroidery-specific materials. I'm going to be fully honest with you and say, you know, when I was first testing on patch making, uh, obviously, I looked at what people were really doing in the real world. And though I said, hey, the plastic method, we have these great things. We have the MFS system from Madeira. It's a great system if we're using a plastic film for patches. We have now the plastic films that they sell that work excellently. But if I were going to tell you that you can't just hoop up a piece of uh, the right vinyl that you get from the uh, fabric section at Walmart and produce a patch that's worthwhile, I'd be lying to you. Do I recommend that you constantly raid the stash of like plastic bags from the dry cleaners to make things? No, not all the time, because sometimes when you're doing these kinds of testing, you may find that either it's not reliable, that the material is not uniform, it's not always the right thickness as you need it, or that you can't always secure it. When it's something like this, like this vinyl that is readily available from fabric stores or Walmarts or big box stores, whatever, and you can get it and it's always the same thickness and it does provide a result, it's hard for me to tell you that you need to go buy the embroidery specific stuff if you can't get to it. Does the embroidery specific stuff work a little better? In my mind, I like the way it works a little bit better. I like the traction and, and tack that it has because it has a little bit of texture on it. Does this plastic work? Absolutely. Also, uh, I didn't digitize this original first little design for patches. This one that I've shown before, it is an existing design I had that when I looked at it, I realized that it had the stability and the underlay in it that it would work. Because I was using it where I had a lot of high contrast, I used a pretty uh, deep underlay that was a mesh style underlay for some of these areas and I used decent densities. I looked at the thickness of the border. It was a little thin, but I wanted to see how it would work on the plastic and it worked from the get-go. Does it mean that every design can immediately be done on patch for patches? No, it does not. They need to tie in. They need to have some basis and some material to them. But can it work? Yes, it can if you know what's coming about. If you know what structure in your underlay, what structure in your designs will hold up when you remove the rest of that stabilizer. And in this case with the plastic, it's not all removed. So there is still some body, though the perforations can cause uh, separation inside the design. If you have thread that overlaps in the right areas, you can use it just like other patch designs. Another digitizing thing. Here it is as a design I did for the Western Regional. It was a, a meet of Corvette owners. And what I'm gonna show you is you see this kind of rainbow gradient that's in the background, looks pretty nice. Uh, this is a, unfortunately a lower res picture. I don't have a higher res picture on me for this one. Unfortunately, I thought I had one and didn't. So I had to use one of my lower res pictures from the original. Um, I believe this was from promotional material we threw on the web to sell these. But the Western Regional design, it has this kind of gradient in it. You know, when I talk about gradients, I talk about layering in 
lower density areas of color for things. This is a small left chest. And to be honest with you, in this piece, I didn't lower the density very much. I only used a little bit of blending on top of each thing that, or each block that goes down. And so I left the original densities as I went on top of this. Is it a little higher than target density? Yes, but not enough to matter, especially in how small of a space this is. Because you can see that these lines here are fairly thin, that is a doubled straight stitch that is not any more than that. Then you know that this is not a big vertical area that I'm blending that kind of rainbow blend into. Four, five, six rows of additional stitching in one color from one to the next to make the blend happen. I didn't bother trying to knock those out of the stitching underneath it. And in fact, in this particular case, somebody would also ask, hey, did you knock out that fill underneath these yellow letters? No, I did not. Because a layer of satin stitch, even at full density on top of a layer of fill, is not going to be overly dense or overly built up. I did cut away everything that was underneath the body of the car. I did cut away anywhere we were going to have a full coverage under these edges by the detail areas. But under the regional text there, it is not cut out. There are no holes. It's definitely, and I actually consider that to be with the rules. The funny thing is I've had tons of people try and gotcha me by saying, you can't have that many layers together. And I consistently say throughout my career, I've been able to put a layer of satin stitches at full density on top of a full density fill, even on lighter garments without too much worry. Yes, we sometimes pull back our densities in general for the lighter garments, but one layer of satin on top of that fill is not gonna be a problem because we're also talking about what I always call three-dimensional density. A lot of the problems with density aren't it being packed together on the surface. It's how many uh, areas, how many needle penetrations are all packed in a small area. And when we're talking about a fill that's already laid down and we only have penetration points at the edges of our satin stitches, we only have a certain amount of that three-dimensional density, the density through the material that we're dealing with. It's not going to cause the trouble. But depending on who you talk to, you're going to get a gotcha where somebody says you got to cut out all the stitches underneath there. I wouldn't recommend it, especially not at that size with sub four millimeter gaps. You're going to add more stitching by trying to travel around all those holes in the fill. You're better off to leave that fill intact, in my opinion. But like I said, what is that? Even in my opinion, hey, that's a rule of thumb. Go test for yourself. <laughs> Rules change. These are things that we can always go for. Now, at the last, as we're kind of coming down to the end of this, uh, I certainly want to kind of talk about some other stuff for you guys. Uh, certainly, let me grab a couple of comments before I finish it up, but I want to talk briefly about business rules that people say in the same way, and I think it's something that's interesting. If you're not in business, maybe it won't be the same for you, but some of these rules may still make sense to you, and we can talk about that as we go. And as like I said, as we're finishing up, if you have any final comments, things you want to share about rules that you've heard, that you broke and survived, or things that you think should be rules or shouldn't be rules of thumb, should or shouldn't be guidelines, by all means, share those in the comments. Uh, last couple of comments. Gina says, cotton thread is also good for light, lighter tension on fabric. I like cotton thread. I also like spun polyester, which doesn't have lighter tension, but I just like it for texture, and it actually allows for some lighter densities, which is nice. Cotton thread's cool. The only thing I'm going to tell everybody with cotton thread is be prepared for lint. Once again, somebody might tell you, you can only use polyester thread for commercial embroidery. Absolutely not. You can use any thread for commercial embroidery. You just have to know what that does to affect your run times, what that does to affect how you have to clean up, and you have to price accordingly to make it make sense for you. I've used all manner of threads. And in fact, you want to talk about all manner of threads? We'll talk about this briefly before we get into the business side. I will just share you a couple of the other pieces that we have here on the, on the board in this gallery. This is a very early piece I did for someone and it is unfortunately, once again, a low res piece. One of my earliest uh, Scandinavian flavored, Viking age flavored designs that I had to do was this piece. Uh, somebody redrew in a in a very like Ringerica style uh, design. Uh, this Norse horse is what they called it. And they first ran it in standard round. They liked it, but they wanted something a little more earthy looking. And so I got standard spun poly, kind of rough looking sewing thread back down my densities a little bit and I ran it. And it ran fine because that thread is meant to run at speeds for construction. Yeah, I had to back my densities down a little bit because it's a little bit thicker. At least it ran a little bit thicker. It was fuzzy. Yes, it's more likely to have some lint on the machine. Did it look cool? Yes. Did we run some pieces and did we get a result? Yes. Uh, same thing here. One of my other designs, same thing. Spun polyester thread in the commercial, in the retail world, in the world of kind of fashion, or even if you want to talk high, you know, kind of high store fashion, the stuff that's in the, in the mall, in the markets, 
you definitely see spun polyester thread used. When I first came in, the idea of a slightly fuzzy thread is not something you would see. And in fact, in some of the times when I'm, I'm working on this stuff and I want to use a slightly fuzzier thread that is not uh, as shiny as the poly we use for embroidery, I will throw serger thread or sewing thread on the machine. The thing is, I know that it runs thicker or thinner. I do swatch tests and I reduce my densities to make sure it's going to run okay and that I don't bind it up. I use appropriate needles. I use densities that make sense, but I also will use different kinds of thread for different kinds of customers. And honestly, some of the creative people I respect the most, you think of uh, Jeremy Picker over at uh, Amber Creative. He uses spun poly for a lot of his pieces to give it kind of a vintage edge. And honestly, the people who are doing work in, in a more retail space often use different kinds of threads to make things happen. Whereas sometimes, depending on where you're from, you may have a very restrictive view of that stuff. Uh, another thing, true. I also, somebody said, no, you would never do any professional testing or work on a home style machine. I heard that tons when I was younger uh, in the business, but I'm going to tell you this. Uh, I got this job, which these were all done on in a commercial machine, in fact, done at a patch factory. But when I wanted to uh, make the initial sample to sell it to somebody, I was off on the weekend at home alone, and I decided to put my own time in to make a sample to sell this client to show them what was possible. And I made this little patch with a uh, water soluble stabilizer using thread to create the entire design instead of using a uh, cut poly or cut, you know, poly twill. And I did this on a little single needle home machine. Yes, it runs slow. Did it produce a result that I could show a commercial client? Yes, it did. Would I have run all the patches on it? No, because the efficiency wasn't there. But can you make something that's viable? Yes, you can. And I also know people who use either home style or prosumer machines to do commercial level work. There are people who use them specifically. And like I, I've told this story before, uh, one of my compatriots in Brilliance, Jim, uh, worked in a sew and vac store. He managed it. And he had somebody who did monogramming and they did it on a store where they were on the second floor of a shopping a center and to get up there they wanted a machine that was easy to travel they were going to that store most weekends so in order to bring a machine in and out they got a single needle prosumer style machine that was cylindrical had a hoop that looked very much like what our machines look like but it is plastic has a lighter uh, a lighter chassis on it was able to be moved and driven over in a hatchback you know suv they moved two of those things around and they were making money doing personalization, maybe a little slower, but it's low stitch stuff with a high profit margin done on site. It makes sense for their business model, right? Uh, other stuff too. I did some pieces for um, Stitches Magazine back in the day when they were doing fashion shoots. This is one of the fashion shoots they did with what I always call my Anglo-Saxon dress. Uh, it has a piece that has some Frank Frankish and Anglo-Saxon um, historical kind of designs that I put together. And when we look at the belt, it has a little worse for wear after being carried in my sample case forever. But what you're going to see is that this is not stitched on that light knit dress. This is applied and the initial piece was stitched on organza like a lace. And then it was applied after the fact to the piece. This is not a usual commercial thing to do, but when you're making something for fashion, especially when you think of pieces that may be worth a much higher margin, you can get away with having two processes of application to get things done. Another one that's kind of different, uh, when I was testing for Q104, which is a material that is now kind of available again as a different kinds of uh, puff. It's a thick batting-like material that washes completely away. You'll see this piece here, and this was done on a natural organic t-shirt, but you're going to see it's a little loopy, a little loose. I didn't mind this loose, loopy texture, especially because over in the topping here, you stitch that topping over the top of this batting like material. And when you wash it away, it looks nice and three dimensional, but it's loose and it can be a little distressed, a little wavy. It can move over time. So this is what it looks like on an angle. And when this is washed out, it's not entirely thick like 3D foam, but it does hold up to some degree. It has some space and it has some loft. And what I decided is I wanted this to be a very soft hand on this garment. I used water soluble stabilizer on the inside and the water soluble topping on the outside. So I had these big thick stitches that were locked in in the process, but there's a little bit of looseness to the stitching underneath it in the Lotus. And honestly, I was okay with that. The thing is, you would tell me if you're looking at this, that's too loopy, it looks loose. It's not what we would really want out of our texture. And you may even recommend to me that I leave my stabilizer in. 
In this case, on this light organic natural t-shirt with this light decoration, where I'm using this wash away uh, material that allows for a distressed kind of look to the top dimensional portion of this thing, I was cool with the results. So I washed away all of my stabilization. Does it stretch a little bit? Does it deform a little bit? Yes. Is that okay with this design? Yes. So that's the thing. We, we learn what things are going to do so that we can play with the results. And like I said, rules change, things change, models change. So very last, we've got maybe 10 minutes left. We'll just go ahead and give you a couple of cool, interesting things to talk about. And we'll just talk about business in this, though I will give last couple of comments here. Thank you for saying this, the work's beautiful, love it. Uh, started on a single needle machine 22 years ago, it works, absolutely. You can build from that and the basics of embroidery are the basics of embroidery. I've gone back and forth. I, I very distinctly remember digitizing on my very commercial minded QDT system that was meant to run big pieces. It was, it was the system that I had originally was made for the people at Moritz. If you don't know who QDT Moritz are, they're a large badge company with a lot of history. So they're making emblems they're making patches still to this day. The, the, the software I had was made for that. I was converting out my stuff to home formats and I was giving it to people with the original four by four single needle home machines that were out at the time. As soon as they could read files, uh, from a written card, I was producing files for home machines at the same time as I was producing for commercials. Definitely a dyed in the wool commercial guy, but I knew that if I could produce the stitches for for the home machine or for the commercial machines, I could do it for home. Though I will say it took running a home machine to understand some of the things that they struggle with to do better. But that was another thing that for me was breaking the rules. You know what else was breaking the rules, frankly? Before I finish off with the business stuff, for me, breaking the rules was sharing all this stuff with you guys. The first time I started coming out and blogging and telling everyone about the kinds of things I did to learn digitizing, about embroidery, about my techniques, about the different techniques I was developing, I can't tell you how many old school digitizers didn't like it. Didn't love me sharing everything and giving you guys a, a peek behind the curtain, right? Didn't love that. And I shared openly, I taught anyone who asked, if you emailed me, I answered questions. To this day, I do that, though admittedly, I get so many and I have so much to do that I can't answer everybody as promptly as I would love to. But if someone asked me, I taught, because I believe that that information should be free. And I believe there is no reason to protect these techniques in the way that they were being protected before. They should be out there for all of us to learn and get better. That was breaking the rules for me back in the day. But hey, rules change. How many of us are educators ourselves? How many of the people do you know in this business who share and teach and try and bring that culture of sharing and openness to what we do? That's breaking the rules too. Models change. And the funny thing is now there are people who are out there teaching and bringing that value because it's a model to make their own business happen. Models change over time. Attitudes change over time. Rules change. But let's talk briefly about some business rules. So some business and promotion rules. Uh, the first one, I love designers. I love you guys. I am an amateur. I am not educated enough to say I am a designer. Have I designed lots of things as an ad hoc designer as needed? Yes, I have. But am I a, a designer with a degree? No, I'm not. But what I get sometimes is that we should never work for free. And the rule really is no spec work. What I'm going to tell you is maybe not the most popular thing ever. I agree that we shouldn't do things that are not valuable to us. But in the realm of saying no spec work ever, there are times where there's a market we want to break into. There is a customer we want to entertain. There is something we think has potential on the other side of proving it on the other side of producing some work to see if it's possible on the other side of a free sample with someone's logo on it. It has been successful for me in so many ways and over time in so many markets that I would never tell somebody out of hand just to say, boom, never work for free. Don't ever give them a free sample. Don't give things away. And I've had people tell me before when I say, hey, you know what? Sometimes you stitch up someone's logo, you digitize it on your off time, you digitize it and consider it to be marketing costs. And you walk in there and you hand them that piece with their logo on it. And you say, this is what I can do for you. And you pull an order and sometimes an orders over years. It doesn't work every time. You do need to be considerate of who you're doing that with. You shouldn't do spec work for every single person you see, but there are absolutely times where you do work on spec, where you do work on the concept that it's going to pay out and you take the risk. 
just know that it's a risk that you're going to take and think about the market that's there and how well you fit and be sure you have a compelling argument when you walk in or at least a compelling reason why going with you having you provide something is going to be worthwhile to them improve their lives improve their product improve uh, what promotions they're doing with your product but there's a time to take that risk if I in my career had said no spec work, never work for free, especially never work for free, uh, I wouldn't have brought you folks nearly the amount of material I brought over the years because I can't tell you, everybody thinks that we all get paid for everything we write. The first magazine I ever wrote for uh, one time ordered something from me and had me do a piece of work, but every article I ever wrote from, for them was done for free. However, it opened me up to a world of people that I could teach and learn from. It opened me up to being able to travel and educate over time. And it was a way that I ended up being able to have all these interactions with everybody. I took a risk. Was it calculated? Probably not. It, it's something that uh, we, we heard from two other guys this morning. We had an interview with somebody who'd been in the business for uh, you know 40 plus years. And he said, uh, you know, sometimes you're just too dumb to know whether or not something's going to work. And so you do it anyway. And it turns out maybe I was that when I was younger. Maybe I was just excited to get out there and talk to people because I learned uh, digitizing embroidery pretty much in a vacuum in a dark room by myself most of the time. Um, aside from the operator who helped me learn when I very first came on, everything else, especially digitizing, was done as an exercise on my own. But if I had done that attitude and said no spec work, never work for free, there's a lot of opportunities I would close myself off to. Does it mean we should do it all the time? Does it mean we should set up an expectation that we work for free? Absolutely not. You guys know I thoroughly support you knowing your value. And I say on a regular basis, remember that you are spending the limited hours of your life that will never come back. This is you living, not just you working. Know what you're working for. Charge accordingly. However, you also have to know that sometimes it takes some risk to get where we want to go. And if you are comfortable with a risk, someone just yelling at you never work for free doesn't make sense. And sometimes it's the way that you develop proof, especially with people who just don't know enough about what we do or aren't keen to exactly what we're doing. They're not already in the market. Sometimes it can be also the differentiator between you and someone else who won't take the risk. A little bit of buy-in shows good faith. So am I going to say you do it every time? No. But if we just boil it always down to never work for free, that's not always the way to go. Another one too, something that I've lived through at more than one shop, uh, no customer supplied garments. Uh, even the shops that I was in that said no customer supplied garments sometimes took customer supplied garments. Yes, there was a surcharge on those. Yes, the decorations more expensive than when they were making markup. But this world changed a lot over time. People are able to secure their own garments. And I also know uh, contract decorators and other kinds of decorators who don't like to carry their monetary balance. They don't like their funds to be tied up in undecorated garments being waited to be decorated or having to do things to kind of get a deposit in hand so that they can afford to take on garments or having, their, like I said, just their operating capital tied up so they can do those orders before the customer pays. There are multiple reasons why you might want to take on customer supply. And frankly, we now have a growing market, especially when we're talking about personalization, boutique work, individual fashion style work that you might do for someone that has a nice high margin on it because somebody wants individualized work and understands they're coming to an artisan to get that done, where they may specifically want to bring in something that can't be sourced through our usual sources, or someone who doesn't like the concept of fast fashion, who wants to repurpose an existing garment, who wants to uh, cover an existing design, who wants to make something unique out of a piece maybe they stitched themselves or repaired themselves, and it becomes a different market that you can't serve with this attitude. So is there a reason to say this? Yeah. When you provide the garments yourself, it means it's easier for you to replace garments on which there are errors or which you ruin during the process of embroidering, which is going to happen from time to time. It's easier to replace errors at a lower cost on your dime if you are supplying the garments yourself. Also, it means that you're not likely to find weird, rare, or heirloom garments that you can't replace that you're now forced to kind of have in your shop, potentially lose, potentially damage, or have problems with. And you get to have markup on the garment itself. And in that markup, you get to make some profit there that's outside of the decoration. There is a reason to say this. However, there's a full reason to say, I love 
doing customer supplied garments, I don't have to have my money tied up in stock. I don't have to have money tied up in, or, or I don't have to have problems or difficulty tied up in having someone give me a deposit that covers it if I'm not working with a lot of capital. And I can do things like take on garments that someone would bring in that aren't available to me that I cannot source myself or that I don't care to pay for out of, you know, out of pocket on the way to getting them done. And then we do things like have them sign some indemnification, you know, some form that gives us some form of indemnification that says, if something happens to it in the normal process of embroidery, you understand that this can be damaged. I'll do my best to make the situation correct and lay out what you're willing to do. But you do have some protection in that. Perfectly fine to do that. But you can have a business that works where you can't, where you don't say this. And in fact, where you say, I welcome customer supplied garments or unique projects, especially when we put a nice high profit margin on that stuff to work on garments that are more difficult or to work on garments that other people refuse. So there are reasons for all this stuff. So like I, like I said, whenever we talk about this stuff, what I want to make clear is that though we talk about breaking the rules, whether it's in digitizing, whether it's in execution, whether it's in how we do our business, what we're really usually doing is stretching the rules of thumb. We're going beyond the rules. It's like we're taking off training wheels. The rules of thumb are the training wheels. They allow us to get moving. They make sure we're not going to fall over. They let us move forward quickly without making mistakes. Sometimes we have to take off the training wheels. Also, what you're going to find is the rules of thumb are useful and will always function very likely. But as materials improve, as technologies change, the rules are going to change. And in certain contexts, the rules change in general. And in the world of business, business models may arise and current business models may fall. The joke everybody makes is that I'm, I'm obsessed with spats because what I always say is like, you know what a spat is? It's a, it's a covering for your shoes that buttons on or zips on. And nobody wears these anymore or very few people wear anything like it anymore. But it, at one time, it was much more popular. Uh, well, the last guy who was running the factory for spats, if you hang on tooth and if you hang on tooth and nail to that, you can just end up where you're not relevant anymore, right? That can happen with a market too. If we don't understand that, then we won't know that those changes are coming for us. We might not really understand it. And like I said, when we're talking about rules of thumb, the way we make marks with stitches can be very subjective. The things we can watch for is to understand the material way that stitches work, the way that materials respond to each other, the way that stabilizer helps to support our materials, and understand that what we're trying to get is not a specific layering of, of materials. We're trying to have stability so that we can stitch. It's not a specific thread and only that thread works. It's coverage and the ability to run without either causing too much mess on our machines or having consistent thread breaks. So we can use different threads to achieve that. And sometimes, depending on the context, uh, it will help you. I know certainly um, there are companies who have specifically done pieces for people who wanted fully organic sourcing, and they sourced their own organic cotton threads that weren't really common for embroidery and made them work. There are tons of reasons why you might break the rules. It's just that the rules of thumb for using the materials that we know will work help you to get a result quicker. So let's take a last couple of comments, and then we'll be done for the day. But we have a couple of good ones. Um, Mike says, and I'm going to go ahead and agree with this one because I've dealt with it many a time, no used customer supply garments. Well, okay, here's where I'll agree and disagree. No used customer supply garments in as nothing that comes right off of someone's back. Oh, honestly, what we often did if we had people who wanted to reuse garments or do thrifted garments or whatever it is, is that we stipulate the garment must be clean and has to be washed without a uh, fabric softener and without things that have egregious scents or oils or anything else. Wash this with normal laundry detergent and it has to be washed, clean, dry, and ready to run. The one that gets me, and I'm not calling anybody out, uh, I had some problems running uh, gear for equestrians. If you bring me in a saddle pad or a horse blanket or covers or any sorts of things that go on your horse and you have been riding them hard and putting them away wet and uh, it's covered in mud and horse hair, I don't particularly want to throw it on my machine that costs more than your truck. <laughs> I don't want to throw that grid on my machine and I won't. Uh, we also had some people, and I'll, I won't call them out at all. I won't even say who it was. I had some people who would bring in garments, uh, sometimes that had been previously decorated. They wanted to add personalization to a previously decorated garment. And it was very obviously directly off their person. Uh, it smelled like people and perfume and or cologne. And often smelled like uh, the body of the person who was in it. And usually would have uh, deodorant scars and streaks all on the inside of it still. Yes, people. 
get clean clothes. And even if you're thrifting, go home, wash it, get it fresh before you do any sort of a creative garment reuse, just to keep the rest of us from having to <laughs> smell or handle anything. <laughs> I remember distinctly refusing a garment and throwing it in a sealed bag and putting on the uh, desk of the salesman who brought it to me and said, you can keep that it, until they come back to pick it up. <laughs> Quit ditching it in my office. All right. So last last part here. I'm sorry. I think that this may be Marianne from Santa Fe who came up as Facebook user for some reason. It's probably because you're on your business page. But she says, uh, I share with folks that bring me their garments. I don't guarantee my machine may not be hungry and may eat your garment. 98% of the time all goes well, but 2% of the time things can go wrong. And here's the honest truth I am going to tell you though, guys, having given people a form that kind of indemnifies you against damages, lots of people believe they're okay with the idea of that risk, but are very unhappy when something gets chewed up. Just be very clear with them. The best you can do is communicate ahead of time. And I'll admit um, some of the things I didn't love doing and I did more than once was to stitch on heirloom quilts heirloom handmade quilts where someone's great grandmother had made them and they desperately wanted to add a dedication to them. The one thing I did that probably gave, saved me the most uh, mental space and, and uh, mental anguish was to create essentially patches. I would have them get me a piece of fabric that matched the quilt as well as we could. I would stitch the message on the fabric. And then uh, luckily I had people around us, we had people in our shop that could uh, bind those off or fold those over and hem them so they had a nice clean edge on them rather than doing a like a heavy embroidered edge or a cover stitch. And then we could stitch those onto the quilt for them or let them stitch them on. Making a panel for a quilt is 100% better than putting a 100 year old plus quilt through your machine. Uh, so yeah, that's something that I definitely didn't love doing. Also, I've done uh, heirloom handkerchiefs for weddings that are like great grandmother's handkerchief. I wouldn't do that again unless I had to because they're sometimes very friable. They tear and rip, they're fragile. And I would much rather not stitch on those directly if I didn't have to. But you know, I'm always happy to help if I can with folks, but I'm very clear with my communications. If you ever heard me talk about business, one of the top things I always tell everybody to do is be incredibly clear with your communications and spell everything out. All right. Yeah. Jesus says heirloom baby gowns, also nerve wracking. Absolutely. All heirloom materials. In fact, a lot of you guys who are in the home market are more likely to do this. I've done a few of them. If you've ever done like memory bears or memory quilts where they give you the uh, garment of someone who is deceased to cut into squares. Oh man, that too is a stressful thing because the emotions are running very high. And if anything goes wrong, that's, you know, that's Papa's shirt. That's a rough day for you. So be very careful and very clear with people before you start cutting. <laughs> Let's just be clear about that. All right, folks, with that, we're going to let that be the, the uh, take up for today. Last things to remember, once again, remember, we're talking about breaking the rules, but it's not really rules. It's not laws, and it's definitely not laws of nature or laws of physics. We're usually talking about rules of thumb. And when that's the case, then these are guidelines. You can do things that are beyond them as long as you understand the foundational nature of embroidery, of materials, and of the way they work. Remember what you're trying to get as a result and work toward the result, not toward following the recipe necessarily. Following the recipe will get you there. Following the recipe, following the guidelines will keep you from falling flat on your face. But once you're running, take off those training wheels once in a while and stretch. Get out past the envelope and do something interesting. And hey, as long as you're not doing crazy things that will chew your machine up, and I know some of you folks do anyway, uh, <laughs> you should be all right. Give yourself some space to ruin a couple garments. Get yourself some test materials that you can play with and try something new. Uh, you will not be sorry you did so. Keep that beginner's mindset no matter how long you've been doing this. And like I said, remember, rules change, folks. All right, with that... Tell me again in the comments how you broke the rules. If you're catching this on the replay, I'd love to hear how you did things differently and how it benefited you or how you fell on your face sometimes. Because sometimes, hey, it's not about how many times you fall on your face. It's about how many times you get up. With that, let that be it for the take up. And I can't wait to see you guys back here again next week. <laughs>